So I am Kaja Tamakis. I'm the Director of Development at the Institute of Science. I want to first off thank you for your membership at the Institute. We're so grateful for everyone for uh, supporting science, supporting Cranbrook Institute of Science. Um, I would like to just say do a couple of quick housekeeping things. First off, if you have any questions for our presenter this evening, Tim, if you wouldn't mind just saving those questions till the very end, he's scheduled some time to make sure that we can hopefully answer everyone's questions at the end of, of the presentation. And for those of you who have are on Zoom, and if your name on the Zoom is just your first name, maybe, if you could do us a favor and hover over your box, and you'll see there's there'll be a little blue button up at the top with three dots. If you could click those and rename yourself to add your last name, that just helps us to track so we know who came to the lecture. So if you wouldn't mind making sure that your last name, your first and last name is on your box just so we know who is here, that would be super, super helpful. Um, and then saving questions to the end. And I think that that's it. I think it is 7.33, so we should go ahead and get started. So it is my great pleasure to introduce you to the Institute's program presenter, Tim Urban, who will be talking uh, to us this evening about some dinosaurs. Tim, take it away. Hello, uh, yep, my name is Tim Urban. I am the program presenter here at Cranbrook, uh, but I am above all else a huge dinosaur fanatic. I've been obsessed with dinosaurs my whole life, uh, and that is what we're gonna talk about today, uh, specifically, we're going to talk about one of the greatest uh, paleo ecosystems ever discovered called the Hell Creek Formation. Uh, but before we dive into that, I just want to briefly uh, talk about myself real quick, if I can get my slideshow to work. There we go. So um, my fascination with dinosaurs kind of started when I was five or even younger than five. Uh, I watched a movie at a very young age that really opened my eyes up to the the world of these these immense majestic animals and uh that movie was the 1964 classic mothra versus godzilla not not the most paleo accurate movie of all time but for a very young tim uh that was way cooler uh than the tonka trucks i was playing with at the time and then uh just to kind of drive that final little nail in the little paleontologist's coffin, another movie came out that is credited for uh, creating a entirely new generation of paleontologists. And that movie is, of course, uh, Jurassic Park. Uh, Jurassic Park uh, remains to this day one of the biggest influences of my life and uh, is one of the uh, biggest inspirations. Uh, and all of these uh, uh, movies at an early childhood took a young kid like this, uh, that's me on the right hugging the Corinthosaurus, took a young kid like that and kept him going all the way to uh, today. Uh, this picture was actually just last month. So it's, it's funny how things just never change. Uh, but enough about me, Let, uh, let's talk about the Hell Creek Formation. Uh, if you were to go to this formation today, uh, it would look just like this. Uh, the Hell Creek Formation is a rock layer uh, that spreads about through uh, North and South Dakota, Montana, and Wyoming. And uh, in it, it is uh, preserving some of the best fossils of the late Cretaceous period for North America uh, that we can find. Um, but uh, what is a fossil? Uh, we're not going to go too deep into what a fossil is, but just to kind of get everyone on the same page, a fossil is the preserved remains or traces of remains of ancient organisms. Uh, most commonly associated with bones and with that, with dinosaur bones, but fossils can be anything from plant leaves to insects to uh, even soft tissue like organs and uh, skin. And of course, uh, poop, which is called uh, coprolites. Uh, now, how a fossil uh, is actually preserved uh, is detailed in this handy little diagram. Here we have a triceratops that has unfortunately met its end at the edge of a river. Uh, over time, that river will cover that body of the triceratops completely, uh, cover it in water and in fine substrate, like you know the sand at the bottom of the river. 
over time, that rock or that, that substrate turns to rock and then uh, fossilizes the bones inside. Uh, after millions and millions of years, uh, the natural weathering occurs, like wind buffeting the rock or, or raining down and wearing the rock away will expose a piece of that bone inside. And that's where paleontologists come along and they will find the piece of the bone uh, poking out and they'll just dig out the rest of the bone. Now the Hell Creek formation uh, looked a lot different uh, 68 to 66 million years ago. In fact, uh, it was a nice lush uh, forested area. Um, a lot of redwood trees actually made up a large amount of the uh, flora in the, uh, the area. Um, interestingly enough, too, uh, the uh, area is full of riverways, and it's even on the side of an ocean. Uh, where the Hell Creek Formation was uh, uh, located in the United States is right here. And during the late Cretaceous period, the United States were actually split in half by a uh, inland sea called the Western Interior Seaway. Uh, this is why you'll actually find shark teeth in Kansas. Uh, but the Hell Creek Formation rests right along the shores of this ancient sea. And uh, it has preserved uh, one of the best glimpses into an ancient ecosystem. Uh, an ecosystem is just um, uh, a variety of animals and how they relate to each other. Um, and uh, we get so much more than just dinosaurs here. Uh, there are a numerous amount of fish that get preserved, fish and sharks. There are tons of reptiles, uh, an absolute abundance of turtles among those reptiles. And there are even uh, insects and birds that get preserved too. Um, we're only going to talk about the more popular animals in this formation, which are the dinosaurs. So uh, we're going to start with one of my favorites. That is, of course, the Struthiomimus. Uh, Struthiomimus sedans is an interesting uh, herbivorous dinosaur. Uh, it might look familiar to you uh, because it looks very similar to a ostrich. In fact, the name Struthiomimus actually means ostrich mimic. Uh, we believe that Struthiomimus kind of lived a very, very similar lifestyle and even had a very similar diet, which is mostly plant material. However, um, uh, it's quite possible that they would have fed on small reptiles and maybe even a couple mammals here and there uh, during their time. Possibly the most noteworthy part of Struthiomimus is in their foot bones. Uh, if you can kind of see in that picture of that foot, um, you have the three long bones at the top, and those bones are called the metatarsals. Now, uh, if you pay close attention to those three metatarsals, you'll notice that the middle one is being pinched at the very top by the other two. Uh, this is something uh, paleontologists call the arctometatarsalian condition. Uh, never play Scrabble with a paleontologist, you'll, you'll always lose. Uh, but anyway, arctometatarsalian condition is just a fancy way of saying that the middle metatarsal is being pinched at the top. Uh, it is widely believed that uh, the pinching of the metatarsals actually make the feet uh, more efficient at running. Uh, so any action you make, any movement you make, actually eats up your energy. And so anything your body can do to require less energy to make that motion uh, is gonna make it more efficient. So uh, what this metatarsalian condition does is it makes each step a little bit springier and therefore requires less energy to lift up off the ground, uh, thereby making, uh, making it much easier for the Struthiomimus to run particularly fast. And it really was fast. Um, paleontologists believe that it uh, ran at an estimated 50 miles an hour. Uh, some people even think it may have, was, may have been even faster than that. Um, what's interesting is uh, this arctometatarsalian condition is not known just from Struthiomimus in the Hell Creek Formation. Uh, there's another dinosaur we'll talk later that also has that same uh, condition. Uh, but moving on, we're going to talk about probably the most unnecessarily long dinosaur name ever, uh, that dinosaur being Pachycephalosaurus wyomingensis. 
Uh, Pachycephalosaurus is uh, a kind of famous because it has that helmeted domed head. Um, it doesn't take much imagination to guess what the, the domed head would have been for, um, uh, and that is uh, headbutting each other. So in most dinosaurs, like uh, Struthiomimus, the skull connects to the, uh, the, the neck at the very back of the skull, which means if Struthiomimus wanted to headbutt something, they'd have to lower their head at almost a 90 degree angle which means if they try to headbutt something, all that pressure is exerted where the neck meets the head and they have a really good chance of breaking their own necks. Whereas Pachycephalosaurus's neck actually connects at the very bottom of the skull. It gives, uh, gives a weird shape when it's at rest. You can kind of see there it has almost a stubby neck and it, it looks like it's shrunken down a bit. But when Pachycephalosaurus lowers its head, instead of being at a 90 degree angle, that head is now completely lined up with not only its neck, but also its backbones too. Now it has absolutely no chance of breaking its own neck and it actually even reinforces that head even more, making each blow that it's going for uh, much more impactful. Uh, as cool as the headbutting is, however, uh, my favorite thing about Pachycephalosaurus is actually the study of its lifespan. So in the Hell Creek Formation, there are three different dinosaurs uh, that uh, have these helmeted heads uh, known to science. The first one is Draco Rex Hogwartsia. It is a small little dinosaur. And uh, if you're a fan of Harry Potter, you'll like this one. Its name literally translates to the Dragon King of Hogwarts. Uh, there is a medium-sized uh, uh, head-butting dinosaur called Stiggy Moloch. And then of course, there is the large Pachycephalosaurus. However, what a lot of scientists believe, uh, myself actually included, uh, is that we're not looking at three uh, individual dinosaurs. We're actually all looking at one Pachycephalosaurus in a specific stage in its life. So what we now think is that Pachycephalosaurus, uh, when it was very young, it actually wouldn't have had these uh, helmeted heads and it instead would have had large spikes. And as it grew, the helmet grows with it and the spikes shrink down until ultimately uh, being uh, the fully grown Pachycephalosaurus that we all recognize. But why would it do that? Uh, headbutting is very common actually in the dinosaur world. Um, and it's you, or not just the dinosaur world, the world in general. And it's used to kind of establish dominance uh, and uh, fight for, for a mate. And if, this headbutting feature is only for uh, fighting for a mate. You really only need it when you're an adult. So that is why we think that the, uh, the domed head grows uh, with age and only develops fully once it's fully grown. Uh, the next dinosaur is also well known. You'll notice a theme that most dinosaurs from the Hell Creek Formation uh, are very popular in pop culture. Uh, this dinosaur is Ankylosaurus. Uh, it is one of the most heavily armored dinosaurs. Uh, the armor is actually made up of a substance called keratin, which is the exact same thing our fingernails are made out of. And not only did it uh, have armor from head to toe, it even had armor uh, on its eyelids, which I think is uh, amazing. Um, one of its most iconic features though, is that clubbed tail that it has. Um, we long speculated that that clubbed tail was for uh, self-defense. Uh, recent fossils have actually proven this. Uh, they've actually found uh, fossils of predators and other herbivores with injuries sustained to their bones uh, attributed to these clubbed tails. Uh, what's interesting too is these clubbed tails were very thickly made of bone and covered in that keratin. And uh, then not only did uh, the tails have standard vertebra, but they were also supported by rod-like structures that made the tail stiffer and therefore easier to use. Uh, a really interesting thing about Ankylosaurus is because they're so heavily armored, the uh, last meal of a preserved uh, Ankylosaur is usually preserved. Uh, by studying this uh, food that was fossilized with the body of the Ankylosaurus, we can kind of get a really good idea at what their diet was. And what paleontologists noticed 
is not only are they eating a large amount of ferns, which are soft plants, uh, but those ferns are often covered in a lot of carbon and ash. So the theory is that after a forest fire occurs, and it definitely would have occurred uh, commonly in the Hell Creek Formation, uh, the, after a forest fire clears out an area, some of the first plants to grow are the ferns. They're the fastest growing plants there. And so Ankylosaurus may have been almost like a fire chaser following the, uh, the trails of forest fires to take advantage of all the soft plants that grow up uh, in its wake. Uh, the next dinosaur is Edmontosaurus, named after a location in Canada. Uh, it's actually got a pretty wide distribution and it's found all throughout the Canada and US, including the Hell Creek Formation. Uh, maybe one of the coolest things about Edmontosaurus is that it is actually very commonly preserved uh, with more than just its bones. Uh, it, there have been a few Edmontosaurus now uh, fossilized with skin, muscles, organs, uh, uh, and it gives us one of the best looks at uh, one of these dinosaurs. Uh, because of these uh, mummified Edmontosaurus, uh, we now know that Edmontosaurus was probably striped in real life or when it was alive, uh, very similarly to a zebra. Uh, and it's possible that they behaved just like zebra as well. They did live in large herds and zebra used their stripes to blend in with each other, making it difficult for a predator to spot them. Uh, and it's possible they did the same thing. Uh, and they did have to deal with predators. Uh, there was one such instance uh, that um, made a lot of news uh, back in the 90s, there was a huge debate on whether or not T-Rex was a predator or a scavenger. Uh, and the debate was going back and forth with no real end in sight until someone found a vertebra, a tailbone of an Edmontosaurus with the tip of a T-Rex tooth broken off on the side of the bone. The, the noteworthy part, though, was that the bone healed over top of that T-Rex tooth meaning the Tyrannosaurus rex attacked it when it was alive and it got away. Most uh, predatory attacks in uh, the wild today end in failure anyway. And uh, not only does this show that T-Rex was hunting living prey, but that this predatory failure uh, is just as relevant 68 million years ago as it is today. Uh, probably one of the most common plant eaters in the Hell Creek Formation is maybe the second most popular dinosaur of all time, that being Triceratops. Uh, Triceratops is most iconically known for the three horns on its head, as well as the frill. A lot of people believe that these horns were for self-defense, uh, but now the general consensus is actually, uh, just like Pachycephalosaurus, uh, they might have used their horns instead for uh, attracting mates. Uh, we've learned that the horns and the frill were covered in that same keratin that Ankylosaurus was covered in. And uh, in um, modern days, uh, birds like toucan uh, have very colorful bills, and those bills are for display purposes to show off, and they are also made out of that same keratin that covered these horns. Um, also, just like the Pachycephalosaurus, uh, the horns of Triceratops only develop when they are fully grown. If uh, these horns would have been for self-defense, then uh, the babies should have had them uh, right from the start, since uh, baby animals tend to be uh, the most vulnerable. Now, we talked about uh, defense from predators a little bit. What's interesting in the Hell Creek Formation is that there are actually very little known predators there. Uh, and by that, I mean, there is just not a huge abundance. Uh, there are a few small predators uh, like this one. This one's name is Archaeoraptor. It is a close, close cousin to Velociraptor and it would have been about the same size. They weren't as big as in the movies. These guys were about the size of a turkey. Uh, and uh, among all of these small predators, they were by far the most common. However, they're mostly known just from teeth. Uh, speaking of known just from teeth, that brings me to another small predator called Pectinodon. It is a weird type of dinosaur called a Troodon, which are similar to raptors, like a Cararaptor, and similar to birds, 
but they're not quite either one and they're kind of in between. But pectinodon is literally only known from a single tooth, uh, making it even rarer and uh, probably not very common if you were to travel back. The largest of these small carnivores was Dakota Raptor. You know, I'll give you one hint where it's from, right? Uh, but Dakota Raptor, uh, despite being the lar uh, second largest raptor species in the in known to science, it still is very rare and uh, in dinosaur standards was not a very large carnivore. And the general thought process is, why is there no small carnivores or why is there such a lack of small carnivores and no medium sized carnivores in this ecosystem? And that is because this ecosystem was absolutely ruled over by none other than the Tyrannosaurus rex. Uh, Tyrannosaurus rex uh, is one of the most common dinosaurs in the Hell Creek Formation. Uh, it is one of, if not the most studied uh, uh, paleontological animal in, in science history. Uh, with over 100 uh, research papers written every single year on T-Rex, which means we actually know a whole lot about it. Uh, T-Rex actually has the largest eyesight or largest eyeballs of any terrestrial animal ever, uh, uh, giving it most likely one of the best eyesights of all time. Uh, T-Rex also had eyes on the front of its head rather than the sides, which gave it depth perception. Um, T-Rex also has uh, the world record for the strongest terrestrial bite force of all time as well, uh, with a bite force of about 12,000 PSI. Uh, interestingly enough, too, uh, we talked about the Arctomedetarsalian condition in Struthiomimus, how it was so fast because it had the metatarsals being pinched. And T-Rex is the other animal in this ecosystem that had it which tells us that T-Rex was exceptionally fast. Uh, as an adult, it weighed nine tons. Uh, they estimate it ran to up to about 15 miles an hour. However, T-Rex, just like Pachycephalosaurus and Triceratops, changed very dramatically as they aged. Uh, they actually started their life uh, very small and skinny uh, and therefore was probably extremely fast, probably on the level, if not just a little bit small, uh, slower than the Struthiomimus. Um, interestingly enough too, they were incredibly intelligent. Um, some studies called an encephalization quotient, where they look at the size of a brain in one animal and compare it to the brain of another, uh, has shown us that T-Rex at its bare minimum was about as smart as a crow or a raven. And crows and ravens are actually one of the smartest animals today. Uh, showing problem solving skills, as well as uh, water displacement, uh, understanding of water displacement. Uh, some scientists have taken uh, T-Rex's uh, intelligence even further than that, and have estimated that T-Rex was as smart as a chimpanzee, which is a little terrifying considering all of the, uh, the world records T-Rex has under its belt. Despite all this though, um, people being people will still relentlessly mock, bully, and tease T-Rex for one thing, that being those extremely tiny arms. Even though their arms were so small for their body, studies have shown us that they could curl 430 pounds, uh, which uh, is amazingly uh, uh, powerful considering the fact that their arms were about as long as ours. Uh, and uh, you know what, that brings me to the end here. Uh, uh, I can answer a couple questions now. I think we have around five minutes or so. Um, I don't see any questions. I don't know if, if you can, Katja. Yeah, let's, I don't see questions yet. Let's give people a few moments. Sometimes it takes some time. Oh, I okay. see Andrew has his hand raised. Andrew, you can go ahead and unmute yourself and what you yeah. got. Perfect. Yeah. Nice talk, Tim. That's I was great. wondering just in the last uh, couple of weeks, I heard of two potentially new subspecies of T-Rex that they were <laughs> talking about. I was wondering what your thoughts were on that. Yeah. So that, yeah, that's a great question. And I haven't had a chance to talk about it yet at all. So uh, in the news, you might see that T-Rex, um, or Tyrannosaurus, I should say, has two new species uh, named. Uh, so we have Tyrannosaurus rex. Now they are saying there is a Tyrannosaurus regina, 
and a Tyrannosaurus Imperator. Uh, those names meaning Tyrant Lizard Queen and Tyrant Lizard Emperor. And they based this uh, study, it was one uh, paleo artist actually, it's a paleontologist, a paleo artist. He based this research on the fact that if you look at all the different Tyrannosaurus skeletons, there are some morphological differences in the bones. And he concluded that because some bones are different in some T-Rex and some bones look even more different in others, then perhaps those are different species. However, the consensus among the rest of the paleontologists, including some Tyrannosaur experts, is that what we're not seeing or what we're seeing is not species variation. It's actually just individuality within T-Rex. So my skeleton is going to look slightly different than your skeleton to a scientist who is looking very closely for any kind of difference. Uh, and it's just because we are built different, just slightly. And uh, so it's still up for debate. And right now, that's what they think we're seeing is just individuality. But hey, you know, there's always a chance. <laughs> yeah, very cool. Thanks. Awesome. Tim, there's a couple of questions in the chat. Okay. A question about how many dinos were in the world and uh, maybe more clarification on what exactly is a subspecies. Oh, okay. So for the first question, uh, what a dino or how many dinos it is, that's actually a kind of a hard question to answer. Uh, there's actually a new dinosaur being named once a week now, which is very fast and very hard to keep up with. And I've tried. Uh, but another problem is, as we've kind of touched on, is we're learning that what we used to think was a separate dinosaur may in fact just be a younger version of a dinosaur we already knew. So unfortunately, uh, I can't quite answer how many dinosaurs there were just because there, there's really no way of knowing for sure. Uh, as for the other question, what a subspecies is, um, uh, a good way to describe that is, uh, you know how there are many, many different types of eagles, for example, but there's only one bald eagle. And the same goes for other animals as well. There were many, many different types of tyrannosaurs, but there's only one Tyrannosaurus rex. I, I hope that explains it a little, a little easier. Looks like it did. Uh, great question from Janet. What do we currently think T-Rex used those arms for? Oh, okay. So great question about the arms. Um, so uh, the claws on a T-Rex's hand are very sharp and curved, and they're very long. Uh, they would have looked like the talons on an owl. So with that in mind, you can expect that they probably used those claws to hook in and hold on real tight with something. Uh, what a lot of predators do today, uh, like lions, for example, is they don't typically eat right where they make the kill. Uh, lions will take back that prey if they can to uh, their territory or, or to a den, for example. And that's what we think T-Rex used the arms for, was to carry its prey after it, after it killed it and uh, walk it back to its own territory. That way, uh, by using its arms, it had its mouth uh, ready to defend itself if another Tyrannosaurus Rex showed up and tried to steal its meal. That is very cool. Thank you, Tim. Do we have any final questions here in the last couple minutes that we have? No? All right. Uh, Tim, huge thanks to you. What yeah. a fascinating, fascinating yeah. subject. I'm, I'm so grateful to you and so grateful to um, our members for joining us this evening. Thank you and enjoy your evening. Thanks so much for listening, everybody. <laughs>